I'm going to go through chapter seven with you and um, uh, hypothesis testing, which is probably one of the tougher chapters for you to um, kind of learn. It is the foundation of all of our inferential testing. So it is important for you to try to grasp these concepts. So I would recommend going through this PowerPoint um, lecture video, um, practicing the problems. Um, definitely don't miss any active engagements and I will post some extra um, uh, practice activities uh, for you to, to do to be able to um, kind of gain uh, that practice knowledge that you're going to need to be able to succeed in this chapter. So is what we're going to look at first is um, just basically what is hypothesis testing because that's really what um, chapter seven is is laying is this foundation for hypothesis testing. So usually there's this theory kind of a question about some large um, uh, situation in the world and then we come up with a hypothesis which is a testable prediction what we predict would happen in certain situations. And so something that could happen would be that there's um, two groups and, and you're measuring some variable and that variable will differ from one another. Or maybe um, some treatment will have an effect on the outcome uh, that is being measured. Or even one variable predicts another or one variable is related to another variable. So a hypothesis at the most basic level is a testable prediction. It's not a question, it's a testable prediction. So let's look at um, hypothesis testing specifically for statistics. So the general definition of hypothesis testing is um, basically a, a method, a mathematical procedure um, that can test a hypothesis um, about a parameter, which is a value that describes a population, um, using uh, data um, that's uh, from a sample. So we're taking that sample and we're hypothesizing um, towards the population. So it's what it is, is it's to basically, um, we're using that sample to say, oh, what we would see in this sample is what we would see in the greater population. So that means our sample has to be representative. And so basically it, our entire goal is related to probability. So um, when we hear the term determine the likelihood, basically that's the same as probability. So what is the probability that a population parameter is, is, is true? Um, it, you know, what we're hypothesizing, is this true? What is the probability of that? And so for hypothesis testing, we're always gonna go through the four steps and they're always done in a specific order. Now these steps, these four steps, the overall steps are the same from here through the rest of the semester. Now what happens within those steps differs, but the overall um, focus of all four steps is the same for the remainder of the semester. So I'm going to go through the process with you step by step and then we're going to do an example together. So the first step is stating your hypotheses. And yes, I'm saying hypotheses in a plural manner because in actuality there's two hypotheses. There is what we know to be true and what we are expecting or predicting to happen. So what we call what we, our prediction is actually called an alternative hypothesis. So the alternative hypothesis is our prediction. It's a statement that we predict is going to happen. Now, but what is true, what we know to be true is what is called the null. So this is, is basically um, the op, not the opposite, but the contrary to your alternative hypothesis. So until you can disprove the null, you have to accept that it's true. So let's say um, we have found um, over the last 20 years, they did research and they said on average children watch three hours of TV um, per week. And maybe this was um, 
the data was collected over 20 years, but the last reported was maybe 10 years ago. And for some reason, you believe that it's different now, that children don't watch three hours of TV today. You think it's different than it was 10 years ago. So your alternative hypothesis is that children in the U.S. watch a significantly different amount than the expected average of three hours per week. So that's your alternative hypothesis. And if you'll notice, we use a notation of H of one, and then we follow that with our sentence, our, our predictive statement. Our predictive statement needs to have our independent variable and dependent variable. So basically in this case, the independent variable um, is the expected average of three hours. So that's, that's um, we're saying the, the children today. So children in the US today, so that's kind of, it's not a, obviously not an experimental method. So that's how things are grouped. And then um, we're looking at hours of TV per week as our dependent variable. So those need to be within those sentences. So when you state your hypothesis, you have to give me your null and your alternative. So the null is um, using H of O as the notation and then the sentence after. So really it's just children in the US watch the expected average of three hours TV per week. Because that is what we show right now before testing to see if there really is a difference. So um, this is um, our alternative and our null hypothesis that has to be stated in step one. So you will be stating both and they need to be stated with the notations. So think of the null as not. H of O, zero meaning zero, nothing. Nothing's changing, nothing's different, nothing is going on here. Think of H of O, nothing going on here. H of one, if you, if you had, um, kind of this dichotomous, zero means nothing, one means something, think of something's happening. There is change, there is a difference, something's going on, that H of one. So that's, that's how you can kind of think of the null and alternative hypotheses. So um, step two of hypothesis testing is setting the criteria for the decision. Okay, this is where things can get tough. So set the criteria. So, so far up to this point, we've kind of felt like, we've kind of thought, oh, anything in the distribution that falls beyond Z score, uh, a Z score of two, either um, negative beyond negative two or beyond positive two seems to be extreme and significantly different. Well, as researchers, we actually have criteria that's much more specific than that. And we, is what we do is we use the level of significance or an alpha level. An alpha level is a probability value um, that basically sets the criteria for making the decision. So uh, most of our research is using an alpha level of 0.05 or 0.01. Some of the research uses different um, alpha levels than that. But for our class, we're only gonna be using 0.01 or 0.05. So if, we, if I said, oh, we're, we're gonna use alpha level 0.05, basically is what that means is that um, we're only allowing a 5% risk that our sample mean will be significant due to a fluke or just due to error. So we're only allowing a 5% risk. If it was alpha 0.01, we're only allowing a 1% risk. So is, that's really what we're looking at is this, is this probability of an error. So um, alpha level, we use the alpha level and we compare it to the p-value. So if you recall, you know, we have um, the distribution and here's you know, where the mean is here alpha level, if we have an alpha of 0.05, we're always going to place it in the tail, okay? So in this case, I would split 0.05 in half. I'd put 2.5% over here and 2.5% over here. So 
then we would be looking up for our Z scores at that location. So, oops, sorry. So we would wanna find the Z here and we would wanna find the Z here. Well, when we take our sample, we're gonna lay it over the top of that and we're gonna see, oh, does our sample mean fall within the, either one of these areas, within those tells? And remember, whatever this mean is, is gonna have a Z-score, which means it's gonna have a p-value. And we always compare the p to alpha and, and look to see if p is less than alpha. If p is less than alpha, then our test is significant. So this is probably really confusing right now, but we're gonna walk through it, don't worry. And so if the Z-score for our sample mean falls, in the tell beyond our um, criteria or our critical boundary, we can call it a critical boundary. See these right here is this boundary at where that 0.05 in both tells would fall. That's our critical boundary. If our Z score for the sample mean falls anywhere beyond that, we can reject the null, meaning that um, we didn't, we found that. Uh, our sample does not reflect what the null hypothesis states. So the null was that there is no change, there is no difference. So we're rejecting that, that's not ha happening. So that's where the reject the null comes in. Because we're really testing the null, we're never testing the alternative, because the alternative is a prediction, it's not, it's not um, what is known or as stated as true. We're testing the null and trying to disprove the null. So um, there's a couple of different things we can look at. We can look at it as a one-tell test or a two-tell test. So if our prediction um, has direction in it, it's considered a one-tell test. So let's say if we're stating that our hypothesis is suggesting there's going to be an increase, or if it suggests there's going to be a decrease, that would mean, you know, an increase, we would put all of our 5%, all of our 0.05 in the upper tail. So here, like this, we would have our distribution, me, oops, let me move me. Our distribution's right down the middle, well, it's supposed to be in the middle. Here we have our criteria, our critical boundary, I call it, or critical value which is a Z-score, but it's also based off of an alpha level. The alpha, if we have it at 0.05, so if we're using alpha equals 0.05, that means 5% is right here. And so we're looking at this upper part. That means our Z-score would be wherever 5% is located. So our Z, and I call it CB, Z critical value. It is what we would look up. That's if we were looking at the upper tail. Um, so if you were to look in your um, textbook at, um, at for your critical value of a z-score, bear with me, for 0.05 in the upper boundary, Bear with me again. You should be finding uh, one point, I think it's 6.4. So 1.64 if it's all 5% is in that tail. But let's say we're talking about in the lower tail and we're saying a decrease, that means we're looking down here, okay? 5% and our Z critical value is actually negative 1.64, okay? So that's, we wanna be careful that we're, we're aware of what's going on. So wherever um, uh, our alternative hypothesis is predicting, that's where we're gonna put the alpha. Now, there are some times that the, um, the hypothesis is vague. It's not stated as 
uh, an increase or a decrease or higher or lower or more than or less than or faster or slower or anything like that. It's just saying there's going to be a change or there's going to be a difference or it will not be equal to. Um, that is a two-tailed test like I showed you before where we split that 5% in half, put 2.5% in one tail and 2.5% in the other tail. So um, it's just a, a matter of how that alternative hypothesis is stated. Most of our behavioral research is two tells, just because with a two tell test, we have more power. Because if you think about it, if really in reality we think, oh, I bet there's going to be an increase, but I'm going to make this a two tell test. Um, if we used a one tell test, there's a lot more space out here where we could find significance. That's 5% room out there. Whereas if it's a two tell test, you know, then we have just a little bit of space way out here on both sides. We only have 2.5% space in these tails. And so it's further from the mean. And so it's a little bit harder to get out that far um, with your sample means. So it, it's not as powerful. So um, um, we often use the two tail tests so that we're making sure that we decrease how much error we're using. So we would have more power here, so a greater likelihood that we would find significance. But here, we have less chance for error because we're splitting those tells up. Now, um, here's kind of some ideas of these Z critical boundaries or critical values. So here's, if you see this as two tell tests, if you are using 0.05, um, if you notice, here's 0.05, um, 0.05, our boundaries are 1.96 positive and negative 1.96. So you would report that as Z critical value equals positive negative 1.96 if it was a two tail test. At 0.01, if you honest, 0.01, it's 2.58 and negative 2.58. So I'm going to do this. So if we're using a two tail test, the Z critical value equals positive negative 2.58. So we're always looking in the tails now for hypothesis testing, always looking in the tails. And just ignore 0.001 because I won't have you use that, although it is a potential in social behavioral research. Um, here's one tail test. So if you'll notice, 0.05 is if we're looking for an increase. So this table is where our directional for an increase. This table is directional for a decrease. Oops, let's see here, directional for a decrease. All right, my pen is all crazy. So if you notice, these are negatives. So for this, I would report Z critical value equals negative 1.64. Z critical value equals 1.64. It's a positive value in this, on this table. So it's really important to have those signs because um, you gotta realize um, the further you get from the tail, the absolute value will get larger. So think about these as absolute values. Um, further and further from the tail, the absolute value will be a larger number. But if it's below the mean, it's a negative. If it's above the mean, it's a positive. Okay, so after you have set the criteria, which means use the alpha level and found the critical boundary or critical value, then you can start calculating your test statistic. So you really have already learned this. That's the nice part. This is this is you already have the equation down, you know the information, you should be able to do this. So the test statistic is actually what is called a Z obtained. It's our obtained test statistic. It's whatever we have calculated. So the larger the absolute value of this is, the further it is from the mean, um, from the population mean, 
And it means that the higher the chances that we are statistically significant. So again, we have the sample mean minus the population mean divided by the standard error mean of the mean. Remember, standard error of the mean is the population standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size, just as a little refresher. So after we calculate our test statistic, and now I'll go back really quick and remind you, when we're calculating the test statistic, this isn't the only thing we're doing in this step three, because we'll also calculate an effect size and we'll find the p-value, et cetera. But I'm just giving you the most basics right now. We'll go into more detail when I give you examples. Then step four is we're gonna make our decision. So we're basically going to compare our p-value to our LAUFA level. We're gonna compare our Z obtained to our Z critical value. And we're gonna decide, are we rejecting the null or are we not? And so rejecting the null means it fell in the tells beyond that boundary and it is significant. So when we say reject the null, that means we found significance. Um, if we retain the null, that means we did not find significance. So I'll draw this distribution. So let's say right here and here is our critical, ooh, let me go back, sorry. This is a critical value and this is a critical value. Anything beyond here is what we would say, I'm gonna go like this, okay? If our means fall out there, we reject the null, which equals significance. So it's significant. If it's in here, we retain the null. which is not significant. That makes sense. I'm trying to spell it all out. So anywhere in that middle. And not significant means it's, it's too close to the majority of the population of what we would see as the average. So only in the extreme areas would it be significant and rejecting the null. So remember, there's only like two possibilities, either nothing happened or something happened. There is no, well, it was close or anything. So uh, when we are looking at our distribution, our probability values, I always think of it this way. Over here, if we had a probability value of P, or over here, we had a probability of a P, but in this middle area, we have probabilities, oops, we have probability values, right? If we're looking at comparing alpha, okay? If we're like just looking at alpha, here's what I do. Go with the distribution like this. Make this your greater than, less than. If we are comparing P and alpha, if our p-value falls in this area, our alligators or mouths or whatever are eating the p, they're larger. So p-value is larger than alpha when it's in the middle. But if our p-values fall out here, here's where our p is less than alpha, okay? So our p would be less than alpha. So it might be a visual way. So it's just either something happened or something didn't. If it falls right on this line, P is equal to alpha, and that's not significant because we need P to be less than alpha to be significant. So to just kind of give you an idea of how that works. Either it's significant or it's not. So um, while we're um, doing our, our statistics, calculating our statistic and kind of coming up with a decision, deciding whether um, we've rejected the null or we've retained the null, we have to be aware of the types of errors that could occur. Now, whenever I ask you about what kind of error could have occurred, 
your answer should never have anything to do with, I could, make, could have made a calculation error or it could have been a data entry error or no. If I ever ask you about what type of error could you have made in your decision, um, it, you're going to talk about one of these types of errors. And it's usually either type one or type two error. So type one error is um, when you found significance, but um, you shouldn't have, basically. that You have found significance, but you should not have. So um, in this case, maybe the alpha level was not stringent enough. So if you used an alpha level of 0.05, okay, so here's alpha 0.05, you have all this space, right? 5% area. But if you would have used an alpha of 0.01, you would only have this tiny area. Let's say your test statistic fell right here in the middle. Well, you found significance, but it's possible you made a type one error because you used 0.05, which is not stringent enough. So think stringent as strict. So 5% is more room than 1% in the tail. So you maybe should have used 0.01. So, but a type two error is when you, you don't find significance, but you might have sh should have. So that's like if I used 0.01, well, it fell here, fell pretty close, and it would have been significant with 0.05. So maybe, you know, I said it wasn't significant, but I should have said it was significant. So I would resolve the type two error by using a less stringent alpha level. I would use 0.05 instead of 0.01. So it doesn't matter which um, error like or what your result is, there's always going to be an error. You can't avoid one or the other. Either you're going to have a type 1 or a type 2. And so the only time that there's kind of this weird error is if you end up with a type 3 error, and that rarely occurs. But that's if you have a one-tailed test and um, let's say you found significance, but it was in the wrong tell. So let's say we were expecting a decrease in scores. So everything was over here, but we actually found our p-value to be less than the alpha level, but it was, it was way over here. It went in the opposite direction. And so that's a type three error when we predicted things to go one way, but it goes the opposite way in a significant manner. That would be a type three error, rarely ever seen. So usually you're choosing between a type one and a type two error. So errors are probably one of the most difficult topics that I find um, for students. Students have a difficult time wrapping their brain around this. So I, I kind of came up with this um, way of putting it into like a real world scenario for you and hopefully this helps. Um, so I always think of the pregnancy test as an analogy of error. So basically we have to assume a woman is not pregnant until we have evidence, like solid evidence, empirical evidence. So a, a positive pregnancy test. So until we get that positive pregnancy test, we have to assume the null hypothesis, which is that the woman is not pregnant, okay? There might be symptoms, morning sickness, weight gain, lack of a menstrual cycle, whatever. Um, but until that pregnancy test comes back positive, we are, are accepting the null to be true that she is not pregnant. So this is all based around testing that null hypothesis. So thinking of type one error, so let's say um, a woman takes a pregnancy test and shows a positive result, but it, she's actually not pregnant. So we would be rejecting the null. We would be like, oh, you're pregnant. We reject the null that you're not pregnant. So um, you're pregnant, but then she runs out and racks up, you know, a thousand dollars at babies are us on new baby products and is like oops it was a false positive and she's really not pregnant that's a type one error 
saying that something occurred when it really didn't. So the test was just an error. The saying that someone's pregnant when they're really not pregnant. It's a false positive. Now a type two error occurs if we show a false negative result. Uh, now in a real life scenario, with, when we're dealing with pregnancy, that's probably the worst outcome, uh, a, a false negative. Because, okay, so you get a false positive, which is a type one error. She runs out, spends a thousand dollars, but guess what? Those, those products can be returned and she can get the credit on her credit card, the thousand dollars back. But with a type two error, let's say, you know, uh, you get a false negative and you're like, woohoo, I'm not pregnant. I guess I can go out tonight and drink shots. Well, the problem with that is, is you might be causing some damage to your fetus. You don't know you're pregnant when you really are. So a false negative is pretty bad when we're talking about the pregnancy test situation. And so that would be a type two error, a false negative. Now in research, in reality, we would rather, rather have a type two error. We would have rather have a false negative than we would a false positive. So, um, but just in the real world scenario with pregnancy tests, it's kind of the opposite. So um, if, if you wanna think of it in that sense, maybe a, a false positive as a type one, a false negative as a type two. And, and for some people that really does help if you can visualize that. So um, whenever we're talking about error, we also have to um, think about alpha and power because um, error is always influenced by alpha level. So alpha level, obviously, um, the higher the alpha level, the higher probability that you're gonna have a type one error. So um, you, you wanna be careful about that. Um, so alpha level is that significance, it's a probability value, and it's used to set that criteria of that hypothesis test. So it, it is absolutely important to understand the alpha level, um, as it increases, it's gonna increase your risk of a type one error, but also as it increases, it increases your power, which, so that's kind of con conflicting because we want power, obviously. Uh, power is the probability of, of finding significance. So the probability that we're going to be able to see um, uh, an effect or an actual um, uh, change in the data. So the power is the probability of rejecting a, a false null hypothesis. Think of a false null hypothesis as of significance. Uh, rejecting a false null hypothesis is significance. So. That's what power is, is the probability of, of rejecting a false null hypothesis. So uh, as alpha increases, we have greater power, but unfortunately, we also have a greater error for type one error, uh, the unfortunate thing with that is. So with power, there are other factors that influence power. So Instead of us just going, oh, well, we, we obviously have to have a high alpha level to be able to have high power, not necessarily, because we can increase power in other ways. So um, a larger effect size. So effect size really is the difference between the sample mean and the population mean. It's the uh, magnitude of the treatment effect. It's the difference between those two. So as that difference increases, power increases. So just think it as the numerator. So as m minus mu increases, power increases. So the difference between the mean and the mean, as it increases, the power increases. As sample size increases, power increases. If you think about the equation for our z statistic, z obtained, it's m minus mu, the mean minus mean, divided by the standard error of the mean, which is the population standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. So think about if this gets larger, that this whole number gets smaller, which means this number gets bigger. That means it gets further out in the tail, right? So um, as sample size increases, the power will increase. We can also um, 
increase the alpha level using a less stringent alpha level. So instead of using 0.01, we'd use 0.05. But another great way to increase power is use a one tell test. So it, if you think about before here, we have uh, this distribution and we split, and we only have 2.5% here and 2.5% here. If we have an idea of which direction things are gonna go in, that, now we can increase our power by using a one tell test. So I'm gonna put all the 5% in one tell. So that this boundary is closer to the mean than this boundary. It's, this boundary is further from the mean because it's 2.5% in the tell. So using a one tell test can also increase our power greatly. So um, last but not least, we're going to talk about effect size. And that's where I kind of talked about back here, like between effect size, the magnitude of, between the difference. So now I'll show you how you actually calculate effect size. So effect size for hypothesis testing with a, a one sample Z test is we're going to use Cohen's D. And it is what it measures is the number of standard deviations that the treatment affected this, the mean. So, so basically the number of standard deviations that the sample mean um, shifted away from the population mean uh, as um, basically stated by the null hypothesis. So this is basically an equation you've already learned. So the mean minus the mu, so sample mean minus the population mean divided by the standard deviation. And we kind of have um, these ideas of what effect size. So usually a small effect size is point, less than 0 0.20. A medium effect size is 0 0.20 to 0 0.8 basically. And a large effect size is 0 0.8 and larger. So um, Cohen's D is calculated in step three when we're doing our hypothesis testing. So we're gonna go ahead and um, uh, take all of the information we get and we're going to summarize our results in APA format. So we're basically going to take um, all of the results and we're going to report it in a APA format. So we have to have um, the results of the Z test, um, we're going to have the test statistic in there, the p-value, the effect size. We don't ever say reject or retain the null. We either say it's significant or not significant. And um, uh, technically we're not, um, it's not necessary to report an exact p-value. It can be p is greater than alpha or p is less than, but it is recommended to provide the exact p-value. And it, it's often um, reported, these things are often reported with tables or illustrations, but in your case, you won't be doing that. So I'm going to um, pause here and is what I'm going to do is split this up into two sections. So I'm going to go ahead and go through these examples with you in a different presentation so, so we can kind of take a break with this. So follow up in part two of our chapter seven uh, presentation video.